that's Nick. And that's Joseph, and today we're here to talk about The Sunlit Night, the fourth film directed by David Vent, which will be available July 17th, 2020 on digital demand, courtesy of Quiver Distribution. It premiered at the 2019 Sundance Film Festival uh, and stars Jenny Slate. Jenny Slate plays a character named Frances. Mm -hmm. The film opens with her, like, having her artwork being critiqued. Her artwork is being eviscerated. So it seems like she has, like, a residency at a gallery or she works at a gallery. Mm, yeah. Something. It, 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 yeah. I'm not quite clear what she does. But she's an artist. Uh, so, cut to... Because her parents are artists. I think that's important. Anyway, sorry. Well, it's important that her parents are artists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, let me try to tell the story. <laughs> Opens with Frances having her work critiqued, and she's not getting good reviews from these people at the art gallery. Cut to her at a house with her boyfriend swimming in a pool. It's important to note her boyfriend's very good looking. She then gets on a bus soaking wet, so it seems like maybe she had to leave the pool in a hurry. She goes home to her family's house, which is like an apartment in New York. A very cramped apartment. It's her, her sister, mom, and dad. Her and her sister share bunk beds. Mm -hmm. And her mom and dad sleep on a pull-out couch in the living room. Mm -hmm. So she returns home, tells her mom, or tells everyone she broke up with her boyfriend. Her mom's like, well, what did you do? So already it's off on a bad note. Her mom spies a leech on her ass. Mm -hmm. So while she's removing the leech, um, we learn that she was hoping to get like a residency... Yeah, uh, internship. An internship in Japan, but Tokyo. that falls through. So they're having dinner. She notices her sister has a ring, and her sister announces, I'm engaged. And her dad's like, well, that's great, because your mom and I are divorcing. Mm -hmm. So that kind of sends Jenny into a tail, or Francis into a tailspin. She ends up, like, moving into the studio her dad works in, which leads her to... Which Believe. is even more cramped. It's more cramped. So then she's like, well, I have to get out of here. So she goes back to her gallery and says, send me anywhere. I'll mm -hmm. do any job. And it turns out that they have an opening for an artist in Norway. Mm -hmm. He needs an assistant to paint his barn yellow. Cut to her on a boat, headed to this village in Norway. She d works on this art installation for this artist, which basically involves her painting a barn yellow. Yeah. Yellow. While she's there, she meets a young man who she kind of falls for. She also works on her own, like, portrait of a nude woman. She kind of fucks up with her boss um, and ends up leaving. Mm -hmm. Returns home to her sister's wedding. And then the final scene is her having the work she produced while she was in Norway critiqued to, like, rave reviews. Rave. Well, okay, the end. Mm -hmm. All right. What worked for you about this film? Uh, it looks great. It's shot by Martin Algren. Uh, yeah, the Norwegian landscapes in northern Norway, uh, in the Arctic Circle, uh, the sun dappled night and day. Yeah, it looks it looks great. I do really like Jenny Slate, and she's somebody that I always have. It's like yeah, I have a soft spot in my heart for her. Uh, yeah. So and so, if if you do like her and her her natural charisma, uniqueness, nerve, and talent, you'll 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 like some snippets of it. Okay. Uh, I liked the dad, who's played by David Paymer, very well known character actor who you probably know best from Drag Me to Hell or. His Payback. character's name is Levi. Levi is only in the film uh, in the beginning for a short time, and at the very end at the wedding. Mm -hmm. Um. But I thought he was the funniest part. Yes, by far. Of the film. Yeah. <laughs> He's in it so little. Um, there's a lot of visual symbolism, mm -hmm. which is also part of what I didn't like. But I do think the film looks great. So the, a device that's used is Francis. She's relating, relating her experiences and like yeah, talking a lot about of people. Omniscient narration. And while she's doing that, portrait, like famous portraits pop up. Mm -hmm. So she uses those to kind of explain to us like you know, what's going on. She uses a, a painting that I can't recall to describe, like, her family's home. Mm -hmm. It's a, a cool a, device. Is it a Mondrian painting? Oh, you would yeah. know better than I do. But it's effective. I think it's overdone, but mm -hmm. it's effective. 
Um, the mom is played by uh, Jennifer Hecht, Jessica Hecht, who uh, was also the mother in Banana Split. Kind of a similar role. Yeah, I liked her. She kind of reminds me of like a young Cher. Sure. So mm -hmm. I like that. That hair. Yeah. Okay, so what didn't work for me? So this story. Um, okay, so it was a, it was it's based on a novel, and it was uh, directed or it was scripted by the novelist uh, Jennifer Dinerstein Knight, and that might be part of the problem there. Because uh, I'm sure that, I haven't read the novel, but I'm sure it is a lot more psychologically complex. Because uh, this feels like it was edited to shreds without the, the narration and how it's cut. It makes it seem like there was a lot of tooling and tinkering that went on in this. Sure. Um, I, so one issue I had was the life of the artist, Francis, seems kind of absurd. Mm -hmm. Because... Anyone who's gone to school to study art, like the dream is to actually work in art. And I would imagine many people who do study a fine art don't get to work like that. Mm -hmm. But she does. So she has that going for her. She comes from sort of a, I would say some privilege, because both of her parents are gainfully employed. Again, they are artists, but like the father is stuck doing... He's stuck doing, doing something he doesn't like, but he makes money. Diagrams for textbooks. Yeah. Right. She's obviously gone to school. She has this like amazing boyfriend. And, you know, I don't. we don't know anything about that man mm -hmm. except that he's super hot. So I don't know why they would show us he's super hot except to show that she likes to fuck things up. And that's yeah, why I... her mother says, like, what did you do? Yeah. So I think, like, she... Ugh, I, di I didn't think that character was believable as an artist because as soon as she gets to Norway and she meets the artist she'll be working for, the way she treats him just seems so like, 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 like she's oblivious to what it is to like care about your work. The way she handles the project he gives her shows some, dis some lack of respect, which I can't imagine a true artist would. If you would allow yourself to get into that situation, you wouldn't behave that way. Sure. Right? I, so I think her... Beh well, it's like they tell her, like, you're in the middle of Norway. Because she's like, oh, I can't... Like, Oslo is great. And they're like, it's not Oslo, girl. It's like some... The Arctic Circle. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and then this guy's known to be difficult. He fired his last assistant. It's, yeah, he's a notable, or was a notable uh, artist named Nils, played by Fritjör Saheim. So she knows what she's getting into. But then when she gets there, it's like, well, I want to have time to do my own work. And she doesn't really want to follow the rules. I didn't like that. I well, didn't... he's also behind schedule uh, because of things that have happened. So he's expecting her to work 12 hours a day painting this damn barn. Sure, which is fair. But I think, like you said, maybe in the book, it's more flushed out, like what her intentions are. And it just seems very rushed. Her experience with her boss, the Norwegian artist, or the artist in Norway, culminates with he kind of picks at her because she's not doing exactly what he asked her to do. And then he tries to grab a brush, a paintbrush from her. And she kind of freaks out and says, don't you ever touch me again. But then the next day they're like friendly and nice. And they go for a drive and they're having laughs. So I didn't quite understand their dynamic. Well, like many things in the film, his characterization is quite uneven. Yeah. Yeah, his characterization is uneven. Their relationship doesn't quite make sense to me. She develops a relationship with... Um... So uh, uh, Alex Sharp, the Tony Award winning actor playing a young man named Yasha, comes uh, back to bury his father, this Russian diplomat who's died, uh, and there's a funeral. There's a funeral. She notices him right away, like he's walking up a long dirt road, and she asks her boss, can we pick him up? And the boss says, no, we're behind schedule. So, you know, foreshadowing, obviously, she's going to connect with him. She does. There's no real... The connection's very one-sided. It's very flimsy. Uh, she attends the funeral for reasons I don't understand. Mm -hmm. uh, consoles him lightly. Next thing we know, they're having sex in the actual art installation. And then they fall asleep because they're awakened in the morning mm -hmm. by the artist and the inspectors. So, obviously, she's embarrassed. She runs out, and then we. The next scene is her going back home to New York. Mm -hmm. um, Gillian Anderson's in it. Mm -hmm. She plays uh, Sharp's mother, uh, also the widow of the dead man, mm -hmm. a Russian. Did she didn't have anything to do? Not quite sure why they hired her to do this. Not very good Russian accent, I thought. Yeah, it was a lot like Emma Thompson in Last Christmas to me. That it wasted opportunity. 
The woman, so Francis meets a woman or notices a woman working in the local grocery store. Stocking milk. Stocking milk. So this woman's in the freezer and then she does this whole thing about how she believes this woman's in a cage, but maybe we're in the cage, blah, blah, blah. Approaches her to allow, to ask if she can do a nude painting of her. Mm -hmm. But we don't really see that exchange. Right? She, uh, yeah. But, but, but do we understand like why this woman's willing to do it? No. Except in the end, she goes, well, my mom always told me, like, be you and mm -hmm. fuck it or something. But she paints this woman, and it's, you know, we see maybe, like, four scenes of her doing this painting. And in the end, it's that work that she shows to the same artist or critics at the gallery who end up liking it. Mm -hmm. And I don't understand, like, what happened, because Frances is, she has no arc. No, her character, I would say, is just this useless person who kind of, I wouldn't say devolves, but she just continues to make poor decisions and doesn't seem to respect her situation, which I'll get into in a second. But I didn't quite understand, like, how did her painting that woman, like, what did she glean from that experience that, the, like, the painting showed some growth as an artist? Like, that wasn't, maybe in the novel, other things happen, but it just feels very rushed. It feels slapshot. Mm -hmm. My biggest issue with her character is, you know, once again, we see this, like, young, usually privileged, white woman privileged. who's privileged, mm -hmm. who has an education, who actually gets to do what she enjoys, who just can't get her shit together. Like, bitch, you have all the tools. Mm -hmm. And you're still like, I don't know what to do with myself. And, mm -hmm. like, I have to go find myself. Like, literally go off to Norway to find yourself. Mm -hmm. You still fuck that up. Mm -hmm. But then somehow you still end up being okay. Yeah. That bothered me a lot. It, it just, it, it ultimately just felt like a very predictable and arguably pointless film. Well, a note I have is that this film felt like Eurovision mixed with Midsummer. Oh, God. Minus the tear, the music, or the laughs. <laughs> but, like, visually, and also, so Zach Galifianakis is in it. Yes. Playing an American, he's from Cincinnati, mm -hmm. playing, he's an artist who's, like, doing, like, Viking cosplay yeah. and he's recording video that's like become an art installation at the museum and he's museum. exactly what you would expect from Zach Galifianakis yeah and he's also at the wedding or at the funeral for some reason he's but giving there are a eulogy yeah but there for some reason and there are many shots of like him dressed in Viking gear mm -hmm. with like the other people from the village with the backdrop of Norway that reminded me a lot of shots from Eurovision and then also how he's behaving um which is that nice one. Yeah. In Midsummer but, Sweden. Well, no, but Midsummer reminded me of just like... No, I know, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. The, but, the funeral procession and... Yes, but the point is like, it looks like... The film looks good. Yeah. And looks interesting, but <laughs> the, it doesn't take me anywhere. The soundtrack, uh, was I wrote down, was nice-ish... Uh, forcing emotion on us, but I felt at any moment it was going to break into an arcade fire song. <laughs> like, that was the vibe I was getting from it. Um, Lastly, the dad, whose character's name is Levi, he, so, when Frances returns to New York, she returns to her sister's wedding, and mm -hmm. at the reception, the dad gives a really depressing speech. Well, he didn't like the groom. Because either. he didn't like the groom, but his daughter chose him anyway. But his speech kind of turns it around into like, well, this is what love is, and then he kind of explains that he regrets, perhaps, like, leaving his wife. Um, it was uncomfortable, and I thought, well, good. Well, hopefully he's paying for this wedding mm -hmm. if he wants to stand there and give that depressing-ass speech. <laughs> anyway, what would you give this film? Well, I, I had very high expectations for it because I am actually quite a big fan of David Bent's, I think, I believe, so this is his fourth film, his sophomore feature, Wetlands, which introduced us to Carla Jury as this... Uh, who you saw on Amulet recently, um, who is this very sexually liberated young woman who has uh, terrible hygiene, to say the least. It's kind of a disgusting uh, cringe, uh, a film that makes you cringe at the things that happen in it. Uh, so I saw Jenny Slate as somebody uh, considering her work on Big Mouth, an obvious child, like this would be some, a project of filmmaker she'd really want to work with, and it's just so disappointingly flat. Um, and then uh, David Vent's film after that was about bringing Hitler back to modern day Germany and guess who's back, okay. which I haven't seen, or look who's back. Um, and I, it made me wonder, because there's another German film, I wonder if there's some kind of 
uh, kickback or some kind of major discount for filming in Norway. Because uh, Thomas Arslan did a film called Bright Nights in 2017, which is also a father-son reconnection film uh, set on a, as kind of a road trip through the same area in northern Norway. Okay. Uh, because of the, I don't know, that I think with my disappointment in, in it and um, how it's kind of substanceless, uh, I'd say one and a half out of five. I will give it two out of five stars. Anything else? No. Okay, bye. Bye. Thank you.